Ooh, welcome back, big girls. We made a chart today. We made a big chart, and when I make charts, we mean business. And when we mean business, we're talking about how do we cut expenses? How do we cut expenses? We find the cheapest running backs in fantasy football drafts that we think can have very, very positive ROI. You cut expenses, you multiply revenue, and you have a very good fantasy football team. Okay, so today we are going over the cheapest running backs and drafts that I think have the potential to be RB1s in fantasy football. We have no time to waste, so we will talk. And we will yap. <laughs> So we're going to throw this giant ugly chart up on the screen, and if you want to pause and look it over, sure. Uh, I don't think you actually need to, but I'll, I'll explain to you what it is. I went back over the last 10 years, dating back to 2014, so we have 10 seasons. And what I did was like, sure, we can find all the numbers from every RB1, but I don't think that's realistic because like when we're drafting the RB35, hoping for them to be the and RB1. We're not hoping for them to be the RB3, right? We're hoping that they finish the RB9 or the RB11 or something like that. So I want to say, what is what are realistic numbers for you to finish somewhere between the RB9 and the RB12? So you're a back-end RB1, right? That's really all you could hope for. That's all, really all you're looking for when you're looking for these cheap running back alternatives. So went back over the last 10 years, I looked at every running back that finished the season as RB9, 10, 11, or 12. So we have a sample size of 40 running backs, and we looked at a bunch of different pretty base, basic metrics, but I wanted to get into an idea of overall opportunity, yards, touchdowns, those type of things. So here is what we found. Over that 40 running back sample size, the average low-end RB1 had 944 rushing yards, 353 receiving yards, which is just around 1,300 total yards, and nine total touchdowns, around 273 total touches 75 percent of their total touchdowns came by way of rushing 73 percent of their total yards came by way of rushing as well so trying to figure out which running backs fit the bill here we are looking at or looking for running backs that i think probably need north of 250 touches right i said 273 is the average there but i think if you can make up a lot of that by way of receiving Right. If you have 230, 235 touches, but, you know, 70 catches or 65 catches, you can probably creep your way in there. All right. So we're looking at probably needing 250 touches closer to 265, 270 if we want to be if we want to get it done. And I think you probably need to be your team's goal line back. One trend I did notice earlier on in the decade, when you start to look back 14, 15, 16, whatever, there was a lot of running backs catching fewer than 40 passes that made it onto this list that were the back end RB ones. However, over the last three years, Dalvin cook was the only running back who had under 40 and he had 39. So I think obviously this is not account for everyone. That's one through eight, but for the most part, I think you're seeing a trend. And I think this is just kind of common sense that, you know, the back end RB ones are way more involved on their teams in the passing game. And I think just the passing game has kind of exploded because of uh, the number of penalties that quarterbacks take on unnecessary roughness and QB hits and pass interference. So why not skew your offense towards the passing game with the uh, likelihood of probably getting penalties, which overall just you know means more pass attempts, means more targets for these running backs. So I think that's just the overall trend is when you're deciding a tiebreaker, you're obviously going to lean more towards the running back that catches passes as opposed to the standard backs that we've kind of gotten used to over the years. So here's what I did. I put together the list of running backs that are going outside of the top 20 running backs right now per ADP. We looked at everyone from running back 21 down to 51. I didn't take, you know, running backs 13 to 20 because like that's not that's one. Those aren't cheap running backs. So the title of this video is like the cheapest running back ones in fantasy football. So one, no one would be surprised if any of those guys finishes RB1, right? If you're the RB16, it's like that is very much within your range of outcomes. It finishes the fucking RB10. So we just left them off. We got everybody outside of the top 20 running backs. And I gave them a composite score on the right side. Basically, the way I looked at this was like, hey, if I took one guy off of this list and he was the one that became an RB1, what is my confidence level that it is this guy? And I, and I scaled them on a, on a scale of 1 to 10. And I was kind of looking at the following criteria. Do I think this person has a reasonable path to 260, 270 touches? Or if they're going to see closer to 230, 235, 240, will it be very heavily skewed towards targets? Is this person likely to be the team's goal lineback? 
if yes, is the offense good enough to give the back opportunities on the goal line? So I tried to be as objective as possible given that criteria. And here is how the list worked out. And naturally, obviously, as you go down the list, you go down the rankings from 20 to 30, you see a lot more green and yellow. From 30 to 40, you see a lot more yellow and a little bit of orange. And then when you get from 40 to 50, you're starting to see a lot of orange and a lot of red. But I wanted to highlight a few players that maybe were undermining or maybe we just haven't talked about much on this channel yet. The first of which is DeAndre Swift, the Chicago Bears running back. So DeAndre Swift has a 7.4 rating. When I start to look at the situation, it's very easy to just get confused by DeAndre Swift. Going to Chicago, new team, new system, new quarterback, new weapons, new everything. So you're kind of like left scrambling in your brain, like, what am I going to do now? So I tried to break it down. And I'm looking at things that are, you know, red flags are problematic to me. And first thing up is like, of course, you want Caleb Williams to be your quarterback. He's a good quarterback. But we also want Josh Allen to be our quarterback. We also want Jalen Hurts to be our quarterback. And those quarterbacks are not necessarily good for running backs. Not not always bad, not always good, but they do cap your ceiling is, is probably the better way I should say it because you don't get a ton of goal line looks. You don't get a ton of dump off passes because mobile quarterbacks tend to run the ball a little bit more when they are under pressure rather than dumping off to their quarterback. So when I look back at last year's USC offense, the running backs in that offense combined to catch 26 out of the 312 possible receptions in that offense last year, 8.3%. That is a very, very small percentage in an offense. Caleb is also a scrambler. Like everyone knows that everyone knows he's athletic, but he has averaged almost a hundred carries a season in his three college seasons. And college seasons are obviously less games than the NFL seasons, which means that hundred number will probably be a light number for Caleb Williams. And when a quarterback starts to run the ball at that high of a rate, it tends to take away from the running back, both again in the reception total and the rushing total. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of worried that we get a little bit of the Caleb Williams as like a, uh, you know, a Walmart Josh Allen or Jalen Hurts. We don't know what's going to happen on the goal line. I'm also not super confident overall that DeAndre Swift is even going to be the goal line back when they have Khalil Herbert and Roshan Johnson on the team. And I think Khalil Herbert's been a great running back over the years. I think Roshan Johnson's a big guy that can pass block. I question what DeAndre Swift's receiving workload is going to be not his receiving talent but his workload like when you have dudes like when your offense is made up of Keenan Allen DJ Moore Roma Dunze Cole Komet even in the red zone like are you really incentivized to throw the ball to DeAndre Swift when all those dudes are creating so much separation probably not Caleb Williams is a gunslinger he's a playmaker he's like Patrick Mahomes where his first instinct is not to chuck the ball to his running back his first instinct is either take off make a play or make a play downfield and the last kind of nail in the coffin here is their offensive line isn't good either and DeAndre Swift has never run behind a bad offensive line he's always been behind either Detroit or Philly he is a player that doesn't have great vision and that is one of his biggest flaws and has been troublesome for him at the professional level so while I did rate him a 7.4 because it's relative to everybody else on the list and I wouldn't be overly shocked if he outperforms this I think he still should be pretty significantly lower than a lot of the better choices on here despite not being ranked much lower and maybe that comes as a surprise to some people maybe it doesn't I think a lot of people are off him I think a lot of people are on him but that's the way I'm looking at DeAndre Swift now as we move a little bit lower I actually have Tony Pollard RB29, one spot higher, 7.5. Tony Pollard, like people loved his ass for about four years in fantasy football. They could not wait. They were chomping at the bit to see what this dude would do when he became the featured back in Dallas. A lot of offensive line injuries to Dallas's uh, line last year, which I think some of it could be, you know, attributed to why Tony Pollard didn't play well. He overall just didn't really play well, but he did get signed by Tennessee this offseason, three years, $22 million. This is not one of those like Eckler, Zach Moss deals, two years, $8 million. This is a much more significant type beat. Okay. Now, Tennessee sneaky has, has been a pretty damn good run blocking line over the last few years, and they just added another Mueller and JC Latham uh, with their first round picks. So you're talking about back to back first round picks on the O line. This is an Alabama product that weighs 343 pounds. That's a big girl, all right? And while I do think this is going to be a much pass heavier offense than we've seen in recent years, obviously Vrabel and Derrick Henry are gone. I kind of think that type of like up tempo, pass the ball a lot style of play works in the favor of both Tony Pollard and Tajay Spears. I think they're both great. I think they're both catch a ton of passes. Uh, I kind of almost think this could be similar to like Najee and Jalen Warren last year, where Tony Pollard gets a shitload of touches again. And Tajay Spears is also really good in the passing game. So Tony P, he was great for many years in Dallas and then got the chance and he was bad. But I still think that really good players in there somewhere, some of it 
is attributed to Dallas' situation last year with the offensive line. A lot of it is probably Tony Pollard, maybe not ready for the huge workload. But I think he's starting to get to the point where he's probably underrated at this point point. Same with Mr. Brian Robinson Jr. I've got him down at 6.8. I don't think the likelihood is super high and I get it. It's hard to get excited about Brian Robinson Jr. But if I'm thinking of the cutoffs, right, like 260 touches, uh, goal line touches, catching some passes, they bring an Eckler who's obviously going to take some pass catching work, but Gibson is gone, who saw 60 targets. So maybe that just goes to Eckler. Maybe he has a few more than that. Brian Robinson was great at catching passes last year on early downs he caught 36 balls 15 games averaged 10.2 yards per reception which was first in the nfl number five in yards per out run number seven in catch rate he is for sure the goal line back there over austin eckler uh their offensive line shockingly ranked ninth in run blocking last year per pff only two players at the running back position last year had more touchdown receptions than brian robinson did it was just c-mac and jerome ford I think Jaden Daniels in Washington, you remember the the Robert Griffin effect on Alfred Morris. I think he should open up a lot of holes in that line for Brian Robinson, right? He was an RB2 last year, and he missed two games. So Brian Robinson, I think, is being slept on a little bit. I don't think the pass catching was a fluke. He was his final year at Alabama. He caught a shitload of balls, and he's just a good back that can play all three downs. And I've talked about this quite a bit about, like, leaving the the gate open for the Patriots offense to outperform the way that the fantasy community is looking at them. I'm not a huge proponent of Jaden Daniels this year, at least not where he's going on underdog drafts at like quarterback 10, 11. But in case they are good, in case they do have an upside offense this year, Brian Robinson will obviously be a huge beneficiary of that. So Brian Robinson is a little bit of a sleeper for me this year. And I have all my sleepers going live on August 1st in our draft guide, which is available for a discounted price before August 1st, right now on bdge.co. So if you go to bdge.co, you'll see draft guide on the top menu. You will get that for a discounted price until August 1st. But the cheapest way, the least expensive way for you to get it is by going to Underdog Fantasy. As always, if you deposit on their platform for the first time using our code BDGE, BDGE, not only are you going to get the draft guide absolutely free, but they're going to hit you with a bunch of bonuses on your deposit, they'll have a free square up there for you, 0.5 passing yards from Mahomes week one, I believe, uh, and a bunch of other things. We'll be taking a bunch of higher lowers. I believe their week one season long lines actually might have just dropped, which is pretty fucking cool, actually. So again, draft guide, cheapest way, go to underdogfantasy.com or download the app. Use promo code BDGE when you deposit with $10 or more for the first time. Get that draft guide free. If you've already done that in the past, Head over to bdge.co where you can get that sheesh for free. And the last player I want to talk about on this list is Chuba Hubbard. He is the RB51 right now. I have him at a 5.1, which, you know, this I this is apparently an extremely hot take because I've got Jonathan Brooks, who is the RB23 on this list, at a 2.8. I love Jonathan Brooks. He is my RB1 in Dynasty in this class without a doubt. But he is coming off of a very late season ACL tear. He is 20 years old. And I see absolutely zero cause or reason for them to push this kid during his rookie season. They're not going to be a good team. They don't need him to win. This is let's get him up to speed. Let's get him healthy. Let's get him acclimated in 2025. Let's let this dude fucking rip. I think there's a chance that he doesn't even start ready this year. Okay, so I think there's a chance that Brooks is not ready to even start the year. I think Chuba could be like the very clear starter for a month, if not two months of the season. Uh, Miles Sanders was basically cut by the end of last year. He's still on the roster, but he is playing as if he is cut. This is going to be an improved offense. Um, So if Chuba is the starter for a month or two, it'll be in a better situation. They signed Robert Hunt, five years, $100 million, who was the best run blocking guard on the line last year for Miami. They gave Damian Lewis a four-year, $53 million deal. So hopefully that's improved. They're bringing Deontay Johnson. They bring in Xavier Leggett. Hopefully they can move the ball a little bit. Bryce Young takes some some steps up improvement-wise. Shoe Hubbard had 277 touches last year. They like this kid. 277 touches last year. Now, I don't think he's very good, but I can easily tell you the story of how he is relevant again this year. And I think running back 51 is fucking crazy. Do I think he's going to be an RB1 this year? Absolutely fucking not. But he would surprise me less than many, many, many of the names on this list. And also, like, it goes without fucking saying, this is not with, like, injuries involved. I'm not trying to predict if the starter is injured. I'm predicting it based on whether or not this player in his – in his moment right now where he's on the depth chart, his talent, the guys in front of him, whether or not they're going to get on the field and become an RB1 this season. 
Okay, so like, for instance, Trey Benson, I have at a 4.5 or some of you guys like he's going to break out and be an RB1. I am not predicting this as if James Conner, of course, if James Conner goes down, Trey Benson's number shoots up to like a 9.7. Not wouldn't be a fucking surprise to anyone. I am acting as if James Conner would stay healthy for the most part. And that's why I have him at a nine. But if James Conner stays healthy, Trey Benson's path to being an RB1 this year is extremely fucking low. All right. We'll wrap up that video there. Hope you guys uh, enjoyed this video. I did something a little bit different here. I told you we were throwing the chart up on the screen. When we throw the chart on the screen, we mean business. When we mean business, we're cutting expenses. When we cut expenses, we start to draft players like Chuba Hubbard and Tony Pollard and Brian Robin Stain. All right, I'm out. I got to go stream. Uh, we stream on the trivia channel. We're streaming Underdog Draft actually in 10 minutes. We stream on the trivia channel today, Friday. I'll stream on this channel tomorrow, Saturday. Either way, I'll be seeing your face every single day for the next month and a half. I love you. I'm out.